All right, what's poppin'? It's your boy, Big Rich, Queens, New York City, where we get busy, a little Wednesday afternoon business. Went to the doctor, gave him some blood. I'll talk to him later. Gentlemen, come on in, wipe your feet on the rug, throw some smoke in the atmosphere. I just lit up a little bit of platinum purple kush, PPK. Salute to the GGC crew. You know how we do. Let's get busy. Time for another mob spotlight. The olive oil king himself. Giuseppe Joe Profacci. Giuseppe Joe Profacci was an Italian-born New York City Thilacosa Nostra boss who was the founder of what became the Colombo crime family. Established in 1928, this was the last of the five families to be organized. He was the family's boss for over three decades. Giuseppe Profacci was born in Villabate in the province of Palermo, Sicily, on October 2nd, 1897. In 1920, Profaci spent one year in prison in Palermo on theft charges. Profaci's sons were Frank Profaci and John Profaci Sr. Frank eventually joined the Profaci crime family while John Sr. followed legitimate pursuits. Two of the Profaci daughters married the sons of Detroit partnership mobsters William Tocco and Joseph Zarelli. Profaci's brother was Salvatore Profaci, who served as his conciliary for years and is known to have been heavily into dealing of pornographic materials. One of the Profaci's brother-in-laws was Joseph Magliocco, who would eventually become Profaci's underboss. Profaci's niece, Rosali Profaci, was married to Salvatore Bonanno, the son of the Bonanno crime family boss, Joseph Bonanno. Profaci was the uncle of Salvatore Profaci Jr., also a member of the Profaci crime family. Rosalie Profaci offered the following description of her uncle. He was a flamboyant man who smoked big cigars, drove big Cadillacs, and did things like buy tickets to Broadway plays for us cousins. But he didn't buy two or three or even four seats. He bought the whole row. Like a boss. Released from prison in 1921, Profaci emigrated to the United States, arriving in New York City on September 4. Profaci settled in Chicago, where he opened a grocery store and bakery. However, the business was unsuccessful, and in 1925, Profaci relocated to New York, where he entered the olive oil import business. On September 27, 1927, Profaci became a United States citizen. At some point after his move to Brooklyn... Profaci became involved with local gangs. On December 5, 1928, Profaci attended a mob meeting in Cleveland, Ohio that would make him an organized crime boss in Brooklyn. In October of 1928, Brooklyn boss Salvatore Diaquia was murdered, an important part of the Cleveland meeting attended by mobsters from Tampa, Florida, Chicago, and Brooklyn was to appoint Profaci as Aquila's replacement so as to maintain calm among the Brooklyn gangs. Maggioco was named as Profaci's second-in-command. Given Profaci's lack of experience in organized crime, it is unclear why the New York gangs gave him power in Brooklyn. Some speculated that Profaci received this position due to his family status in Sicily, where they may have belonged to the Villabate Mafia. Profaci may have benefited from contacts made through his olive oil business. Cleveland police eventually raided the meeting and expelled the mobsters from Cleveland, but Profaci's business was accomplished. By 1930, Profaci was controlling numbers, prostitution, loan sharking, and narcotics trafficking in Brooklyn. In 1930, the Castellamarasi War broke out in New York City. Some sources say that Profaci remained neutral, while others say that Profaci was firmly aligned with boss Salvatore Maranzano. When the war finally ended in 1931, top mobster Charles Lucky Luciano reorganized the New York gangs into five organized crime families. At this point, Profaci was recognized as boss of what was now the Profaci crime family, with Maggioco as underboss and Salvatore Profaci as conciliari. When Luciano created the National Crime Syndicate, also known as the Mafia Commission, he gave Profaci a seat on the governing board. Profaci's closest ally on the board was Bonanno, who would cooperate with Profaci over the next 30 years. Profaci was also allied with Stefano Magadino, the boss of the Buffalo crime family. 
Profaci obtained most of his wealth through traditional illegal enterprises, such as protection rackets and extortion. However, to protect himself from federal tax evasion charges, Profaci still maintained his original olive oil business, known as Mamma Mia Importing Company, leading to his nickname as Olive Oil King. As the demand for olive oil skyrocketed after World War II, his business thrived. Profaci owned 20 other businesses that employed hundreds of workers in New York. Profaci owned a large house in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, a home in Miami Beach, Florida, and a 328-acre estate near Highstown, New Jersey, which previously belonged to President Theodore Roosevelt. Profaci's estate had its own airstrip and a chapel with an altar that replicated one in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Profaci was a devout Catholic who made generous cash donations to Catholic charities. A member of the Knights of Columbus, Profaci would invite priests to his estate to celebrate Mass. In May 1952, a thief stole a valuable jeweled crown from a shrine in Brooklyn. Profaci sent his men to recover the crowns and reportedly killed the thief. However, accounts of the thief being strangled with a rosary are unfounded. In 1949, the Vatican received a petition from a group of New York Catholics to confer a knighthood on Profaci. However, when the Brooklyn District Attorney complained about the move, the Vatican denied the petition. In 1953, the U.S. IRS Service sued Profaci for over $1.5 million in unpaid income taxes. The taxes were still unpaid when Profaci died nine years later. In 1954, the U.S. Department of Justice moved to revoke Profaci's citizenship. The government claimed that when Profaci entered the United States in 1921, he lied to immigration officials about having no arrest record in Italy. In 1960, a U.S. Court of Appeals reversed Profaci's deportation order, ending the legal action. In 1956, Law enforcement recorded a phone conversation between Profaci and Antonio Catone, a Sicilian mafioso about exporting Sicilian oranges into the United States. In 1959, U.S. Customs agents intercepted one of those orange crates in New York. The crate contained 90 wax oranges containing a total of 110 pounds of pure heroin. Smugglers in Sicily had filled the hollow oranges with heroin until they weighed as much as real oranges, then packed them in the crate. Profaci was never prosecuted for this crime. In 1957, Profaci attended the Appalachian Conference, a national mob meeting at the farm of mobster Joseph Barbara in Appalachian, New York. While the conference was in progress, New York State troopers surrounded the farm and raided it. Profaci was one of over 60 mobsters arrested that day. On January 13, 1960, Profaci and 21 others were convicted of conspiracy and he was sentenced to five years in prison. However, on November 28, 1960, a United States Court of Appeals overturned the verdicts. In contrast to Profaci's generosity to his relatives and the church, many of his soldati considered him miserly and mean with money. One reason for their encore was that Profaci required each family member to pay him a $25 a month tit, an old Sicilian gang custom. The money, which amounted to approximately $50,000 a month, was meant to support the families of mobsters in prison. However, most of this money stayed with Profaci. In addition, Profaci did not tolerate any dissent from his policies. People who expressed discontent were murdered. On February 27, 1961, the Gallows, led by Joe Gallo, kidnapped four of Profaci's top men, underboss Maglioco, Frank Profaci, Joe Profaci's brother, Capo Salvatore Musicia, and soldier John Schimone. Profaci himself eluded capture and flew to sanctuary in Florida. While holding the hostages, Larry and Albert Gallo sent Joe Gallo to California. The Gallows demanded a more favorable financial scheme for the hostage's release. Gallo wanted to kill one hostage and demand $100,000 before negotiations, but his brother Larry overruled them. After a few weeks of negotiation, Profaci made a deal with the Gallows. Profaci's conciliary, Charles Asige Lo Cicero, negotiated with the Gallows and all the hostages were released peacefully. However, Profaci had no intention of honoring this peace agreement. 
On August 20th, 1961, Joseph Provacci ordered the murder of Gallo members Joseph Joe Jelly, Gioelli, and Larry Gallo. Gunman allegedly murdered Gioelli after inviting him to go fishing. Larry Gallo survived a strangulation attempt in the Sahara Club of the East Flatbush by Carmine Persico and Salvatore Sally D'Ambrosio after a police officer intervened. The Gallo brothers had previously aligned with Persico against Profaci and his loyalists. The Gallos then began calling Persico the snake after he had betrayed them. The war continued on, resulting in nine murders and three disappearances. With the start of the gang war, the Gallo crew retreated to the dormitory. By 1962, Profaci's health was failing. In early 1962, Carlo Gambino and Lucchese crime family boss Tommy Lucchese tried to convince Profaci to resign to end the gang war. However, Profaci strongly suspected that the two bosses were secretly supporting the Gallo brothers and wanted to take control of his family. Profaci vehemently refused to resign. Furthermore, he warned that any attempt to remove him would spark a wider gang war. Gambino and Lucchese did not pursue their efforts. On June 6, 1962, Profaci died in Southside Hospital in Bayshore, New York of liver cancer. He is buried at St. John's Cemetery in the Middle Village section of Queens. It's a beautiful cemetery. In one of the largest mausoleums in the cemetery. Salute. After Profaci's death, Maglioco succeeded him as head of the family. In late 1963, the Mafia Commission forced Maglioco out of office and installed Joseph Colombo as family boss. At this point in time, the Profaci crime family became the Colombo crime family. All right, so first of all, great little spotlight. Salute. Team Ruckus, Big Rich, Queens, New York City. We get busy. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Let me know what you're smoking on. And we will talk soon about business. Salute.